want to get into some labor issues today, you guys. This, there's this push of, of strikes and unionization efforts across the country, and I have been inspired to be able to bring you, um, you know, a number of stories along those lines every single week. We're going to start, uh, surprise, surprise to regular viewers, we're going to start with a more perfect union clip. Once again, if you're not following them, please do, you guys. They are I, I don't bring them to you every week because I want to fill the air. I bring them to you because of how fantastic they are. So please go follow More Perfect Union if you are not already. Um, this first one is about the Cheesecake Factory and how they have abused workers throughout the pandemic. We'll watch this come back and discuss. One of the largest employers of low-wage workers in America is a company you've probably never even heard of, a private equity firm called Rourke Capital. Rourke owns Inspire Brands, which employs more than 650,000 people at franchises of Dunkin' Donuts, Sonic, Arby's, Jimmy John's, Baskin Robbins, Buffalo Wild Wings, and until recently, the Cheesecake Factory. The Cheesecake Factory did nothing for us during the pandemic. They're really trimming as much money as they can out of us, like hourly staff. And this is meanwhile when the company is making more money than ever. In April 2020, when restaurants around the country were in crisis due to the pandemic, Rourke Capital bought a controlling stake in the Cheesecake Factory for 200 million. Just one year later, in June 2021, Rourke cashed out. So Rourke more than doubled its money in just over a year, um, or made a $257 million profit. During that year, while Rourke made massive profits, workers were devastated by an astonishing lack of safety, staffing shortages, and poverty wages. Many were forced to work 12-hour days, six days a week, with little to no COVID precautions. We spoke to Cheesecake Factory workers to find out what happens to a business when a private equity firm like Rourke Capital takes over. How the company has responded has been to prioritize their profits over their people. They didn't care about the workers' health, they didn't care about the guests' health either. It was just really disheartening and honestly kind of disgusting to see. They would allow more indoor seating than the CDC recommended. They would allow indoor dining even when the pandemic was in surges because they didn't want to lose that profit. You know, a lot of people did not feel safe coming in. A lot of people felt afraid to take their sick days off because we were still understaffed then. There's definitely a lot of pressure to come in, even if you were ill. The state of California offered workers 10 days of paid time off in case a worker got sick or was uh, facing side effects from using, from getting the vaccine. They did not tell anyone about this. They did the legal minimum and posting notification on it in very small text, hidden away with a lot of other old irrelevant posters. So the vast majority of my, of my coworkers, including myself, didn't know about this uh, until we actively looked into it. I feel like they didn't want to tell us because that would require paying us uh, for a time off. And recently they have been doing everything they can to claw that away from us. You know, I get $9 an hour here. I know there are a lot of states that are still at 213. But when I worked in North Carolina, it was still 213. So again, if the company can pay you 213, they're gonna pay you 213. And as a tipped employee, you will never see a raise. I have seen a lot of injuries and a lot more risky behavior at work um, because of how busy it is. Things like, you know, servers or busters, you know, running with hot drinks or running with very full plates. We end up dropping these more, so, you know, shards of ceramic and glass go everywhere. We all have to stop and clean it up. We have so much pressure on the outside to keep you know, our flow going. There's a high turnover rate with uh, new hires just seeing the workload for the pay and seeing that it's not quite matching up. Uh, the Cheesecake Factory has more than doubled its to-go sales since uh, even before the shutdown. Every location is averaging about $3 million in to-go sales only a year. Rourke Capital got its name and philosophy from the main character Howard Rourke in Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead, a dystopian novel championing unfettered self-interest in the name of individualism over collective well-being. Oh, the fountainhead! Mom, isn't that book the Bible of right-wing losers? But unfettered self-interest from billionaire venture capitalists creates a real-life dystopia for millions of workers across the country. So private equity is investment firms buying up companies 
And their sole reason for buying up these companies is to, to grow cash flow for themselves as much as possible over a period of you know, four to six years. The company that sort of jumps to mind is a company called Rourke Capital. Um, Rourke Capital bragged about how it had helped kill the Raise the Wage Act, which would have you know, established a $15 you know, federal minimum wage and, and ended sub-minimum wages for tipped workers. Rourke employs more than one million workers, 650,000 workers in fast food alone, and they are the second largest food conglomerate in the country. A 2020 report found that a number of Rourke Capital-owned fast food chains, including Dunkin' Donuts, Sonic, Arby's, and Hardee's, had among the highest number of workers relying on food stamps and Medicaid in multiple states. There's a lot of money me being made by investors and higher-ups that we're not seeing, even though we're the ones who are constantly putting in the hard work, going the extra mile. We're taking the moment to tell them that you know this isn't okay, and that we are going to exercise our rights as workers here, uh, and that we do deserve better, and we do deserve a living wage. We're realizing you need us more so in a lot of ways than we need you. I think they're a little afraid of it, certainly, especially with all the things happening with Starbucks workers now. And We know this place could be better. We want not only the guests to be happy, but for the employees to be happy as well, to not be so overworked, to not be so overburdened, to have like pride in the place that we work at. I mean, right now, the CEO makes almost 300 times what the average worker makes. You know, that's a ridiculous sort of dichotomy. Give us all a little slice. Fantastic work as always. Um, you regular viewers know I've gone on ad nauseum about the restaurant industry. I've worked uh, fast food and kitchens um, for most of, of my, you know, uh, employment career. I'm still a student, so I've, I've, you know, that's the work I've done has largely been been food industry stuff. And I have firsthand experience of how horrible it can be and how horrible it can be for my coworkers um, out front dealing with customers. Um, it's just not a fun industry. And it's, it's also an industry that has slimmer profit margins than others, which can lead to even more rapacious behavior than usual. Um, and, you know, shame on the Cheesecake Factory there for exploiting workers like that, especially during a pandemic and, and, and putting them at the risks that they're being put at. Um, good on More Perfect Union for revealing that. Uh, in another story of, of corporate greed, this is uh, about Kroger. And they are up to their same nonsense. I feel like I cover Kroger like every fucking week. Are they like way worse than most? I don't know. It, just, it seems like there's something with Kroger every week. This is in the Daily Poster. It's by Andrew Perez. Kroger goes to Washington. The grocery behemoth taps Washington's tip sheet, tip sheet industry to spin away the headlines about striking workers in poverty wages. So they're basically buying good coverage is the deal here, guys. In recent weeks, uh, Kroger has faced a rash of negative news reports about its employees working and living conditions, drawn, drawing new scrutiny from lawmakers and seen thousands of workers go on strike in Colorado, all as the company lobbies on union rights legislation and bankrolls corporate trade associations trying to kill it. That uh, that strike, by the way, was successful. They did get um, some concessions in Colorado. Uh, ended just a few days ago. Now, amid the potential for congressional hearings and a federal crackdown, the grocery giant did what so many other corporate behemoths do when they're feeling the heat, pay big bucks to run counter programming, claiming it offers great pay and great benefits in a beltway tip sheet read by Washington insiders. The D.C. tip sheets industry, which includes daily email newsletters like Politico, Playbook, Axios AM, and Punchbowl News, may seem obscure, but it serves a special purpose in media. The newsletters are the first thing anyone who's anyone in Washington reads every morning. Their tidbits and scoops help uh, populate cable news shows with gossipy, insidery content that drives the day's coverage, and their journalists are often brought on TV to contextualize the news for viewers. Because of their place in, in the D.C. ecosystem, the tip sheets also serve a more insidious purpose. They have become a reliable avenue for corporate interests to inject their money and viewpoints straight into the political conversation. And Kroger having plenty of reasons to do so lately, closing stores during a pandemic, um, cutting workers during a pandemic, 
mistreating their workers during a pandemic on and on. I feel like I've covered Kroger almost every freaking week. There's always like a local story about them or something like this. Um, their, their CEO boasting about price using the increase in prices to gouge customers even further. I mean, like the, the extent of it is, is hard to even fathom. Um, but this is how they get away with it. You guys, this is how they get away with it. And it's not limited to Kroger. These, this is, they, they, they know that there are a lot of media outlets who, who get a lot of attention and viewership whose sole job is to engage in stenography for them. And so they, they, they go inject their narratives in the right places, and they know that that day's coverage is in large part just going to be a regurgitation of their PR points and, and what their PR team came up with. So this is this is a, a, a sort of a proximity to power in the media that nobody else has afforded outside of these gigantic corporations and banks and military contractors and on and on the usual list of suspects. Right. Um, so shame on Kroger for this one and all the other shit that they've done over the last year that I've been covering. Um, another one we have uh, this is in Vice and it's about REI workers. Unionizing REI workers want their, quote, progressive employer to pay a living wage. Another example, you guys, of a, a, a company pretending to be liberal or progressive or worker friendly or what have you uh, and not being so at all. But one thing I keep coming back to is the fact that REI prides itself on being a great workplace. But why is it that none of us are making a living wage? REI managers began morning shifts this week at the company's flagship store in Manhattan by reading aloud a series of talking points about the company's stance against unionization. Kate Denon, the sales specialist in the camp department at REI's Manhattan store, said managers called the union a third party and claimed it would be bad for REI. Quote, our main communication from the company about the union drive has been through morning huddles, she said. The manager reads the same opening statement. Denon said workers have responded by saying, what do you mean a union would be bad for us? And they're like, we'll get this info for you soon. <laughs> Last Friday, 116 employees at the Soho store in Manhattan filed for a union election with the Retail Warehouse and Department Store Union, the first of the retailers, retailers 15,000 employees nationwide to seek to form a union. REI has long cultivated an image as one of the nation's most progressive retailers, shutting down stores on Black Friday for the past seven years and offering workers annual incentives that kick in when stores hit sales targets. But REI workers in Soho have many concerns that reflect the general precarity of workers of working a non-union job in the retail industry. In particular, they want full-time status and benefits, COVID-19 protections, and grant and guaranteed hours after the holiday season. Denon told Motherboard that despite working 40 hours a week, she and many of her coworkers are classified as part-time and will not receive the health care benefits that come with full-time status until they're working at the company for a year. She says workers at her store are frequently told we don't know when they ask about how they can be converted to full-time status sooner. There's a lot of accountability and transparency issues, she said. New hires at the Manhattan Manhattan store start at roughly $18.90 an hour. MIT's living wage calculator says a living wage in New York City is $21.77 an hour for someone without children. Quote, one thing I keep coming back to is the fact that REI prides itself on being a great workplace, a leader of the outdoors, but why is it that none of us are making a living wage? Denon said, ex explaining why she and her coworkers decided to unionize. Why do you have to work 40 hours a week for 12 months to get health benefits? Why is there no guarantee of hours after the holiday season? These are very basic things that REI has gotten away with not doing, despite the facade of being a progressive liberal company. Great coverage there. Shame on REI. A lot of retailers engage in this kind of stuff. Um, they will, you know, give a, a a sort of performative concession, like closing on Black Friday, um, and then you know portray themselves as though they're progressive. And behind the scenes, they're engaging in in all this nefarious nonsense to try to uh, further exploit their workers, deny their workers uh, basic things like a living wage or guaranteed hours or health care. Um, so uh, as with all these stories, you guys, I encourage you all to get involved with local labor organizing. If, if there are companies in your area that are on strike, please do not cross the picket line. If there are unionization efforts in your area. Do what you can to support. If there's mutual aid to support striking workers in your area, do what you can to support. If there are protests or demonstrations going on, uh, I encourage you to get involved. And one of the reasons is I'm about to show you guys uh, a, a map that actually I never say this covering politics warms my fucking heart. You guys, this is such a fantastic 
uh, I, I would say story, but it's it's really not even a story. It's just an ongoing thing. This is a map of all of the um, open Starbucks union filings. You can find this on unionelections.org. And they show that those those three stores in New York have sparked quite a chain of unionization attempts from Starbucks, numerous in my home state here of Washington. A couple of those stores are in Seattle. I was reading about one in Oregon, one in California, on and on throughout the the, the East Coast as well. Um, you guys can see that this has not just been a couple of stores. It seems to have a snowball effect, and I'm hopeful that all of those efforts will be successful or as many as possible. Um, because when those workers can demonstrate that they that their work environment and their compensation has improved. Um, the arguments made by the company become less and less relevant and carry less and less weight in future fights with other employees. So um, this shit works, you guys. Labor organizing works. Strikes work. Unionization efforts work. And this is a way we can actually somewhat tip the scales of power in our favor. It's never enough and it's never fast enough. And I understand the progressive tendency to kind of constantly be in this state of despair. You know what I mean? Even when a little good thing happens. But I, I hope that some of you can find some hope and inspiration in the fact that this labor organizing push is genuinely working. Those Kroger employees in Colorado got some concessions. Like we have seen this work, okay? And 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 this Starbucks um, map is is another example of that. I encourage you all to get involved in your local um, labor organizing. You can go to More Perfect Union. They they have all sorts of resources to put you in touch uh, with local mutual aid groups for striking workers, uh, things like that. So j I just encourage everybody to get involved wherever you can with the 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 labor push because this is this is really something and the media does not want you to know how important or how big this is and can be so please do your part to make sure it's as big as possible and get involved where you can <laughs>